morning. I'm Cindy, and I am a rule breaker. So I don't know that it is in the sense of the word that came to mind for each of you. I don't know. What did you think about when I said that, about breaking rules? Did you think about maybe your significant other who never goes the speed limit? Um, maybe the guy who you just read about who robbed a bank? Or you may have thought about that kid in high school who spent most of their time in detention. You're smiling. That was you, right? <laughs> I get it. So experience has taught me that there are two different kinds of rule breakers. There are those who break the rules for personal gain, and then there are those who break the rule to change the game. And I want to focus on the latter today because I have two particular thoughts about that kind of rule breaker. First, I think that transformational rule breakers are fueled by one thing and one thing alone, and that's empathy. I think they break the rules to make it better, to make it better for other people, to make it better in society or in the world. And I think in particular that empathy is the DNA of a female rule breaker. So what are rules when you think about that? Rules are those things that keep law and order that I mentioned earlier, uh, those things that we're very clear about, or are there are those rules that are what I'll call the unspoken rules, the truths that the way we do things in society. And I would tell you that I think women are bound by more of those rules. So before you guys and all the guys in the audience get mad at me, for sure, men do wonderful and noble things every single day fueled by empathy. But I would ask you to challenge yourself. Is it not true that more men break the rules on the basis of status, power, or entitlement and when you watch women who break the rules, did they not do it for greater good? They're bound by more of those boxes, and I would argue they have to be really pissed to go out there and do something about it. So let's take uh, me as a case in point, my study. Up till now in my professional career, I'm probably best known for breaking through with the first ever drug for sexual desire in women, what the media called female Viagra. So we broke through with this drug it was a huge news story across the world when we did it, and I will tell you, I absolutely did not do it to create the next blockbuster drug. That was not my ambition, nor was it to have a wonderful sketch on Jimmy Kimmel in which he called it Magic Mike in a Bottle, <laughs> but I kind of did dig that sketch. Um, so that, that, that is not why I did it. I did it because I was in the field of sexual medicine for a long time. I'm Irish, I'm Catholic, sex, of course. My mom wishes I would stop saying that. Um, but uh, here's what I knew from the science already. So I knew this, we had already learned that for some women, not all women, but for some women, about seven to 10%, so that's a number of you already in the room here today, the basis of the lack of interest in sex is biological. So what you're looking at right here on the screen, on the left-hand side, is brain scan imaging of women who have normal desire. They're happy with it. And what you see is their brain is lit up when they're exposed to sexual cues. What that is is your brain lighting up as it shuts down to go into the sexual experience. Look at the contrast on the right. That's the brain scan imaging of a woman with a medical condition called hypoactive sexual desire disorder, or HSDD for short. Those are women who have no biological urge for sex. They might have had it at one point, but they lost it. Do you see the contrast of how their brain is not lighting up when they're exposed to sexual cues? It's never quieting to go into sex. We knew this. We knew this from tons of different brain scan image studies over the course of time. And yet, there were 26 drugs for men and not a single one for women until 2015. And I knew that because one of those 26 drugs for men was mine. It was in a company that I founded and built. So I was watching as the most exciting potential breakthrough for women was coming along in 2010. Um, and I started to think about what are the rules of sex <laughs> as we know them. And if a picture is worth a thousand words, here are the rules of sex as we know it. So basically, we believe that men are as simple as an on-off switch. And women, ugh, they're complicated. What is the single best word to hold up progress? It's complicated. And so these were the rules as we knew them, but that didn't make sense with what I just told you, did it? In fact, it's not so basic that all things for men in the bedroom are biological. 
and all things for women are psychological, and yet we were treating it that way. So rewind back to 2010. I'm at the Sexual Medicine Society meeting. You didn't know there was one of those, did you? I'm a card-carrying member. It makes me really popular at cocktail parties. So I'm at the Sexual Medicine Society meeting in Miami, and I'm being chased around by this fella. His name is Dr. Erwin Goldstein. He is, in fact, the preeminent um, clinician in sexual medicine. I would argue he's pioneered the field. He's the modern-day Masters in Johnson. He got Viagra approved for men, then he switched, and he's done all his work really subsequent to them in women. And so he's chasing me around with his MacBook, and he's telling me, Cindy, Cindy, you need to watch this. When you have been in sexual medicine for some time, you realize when one of those doctors is asking you to look at a video, you look away. So he chased me for quite some time. And here's why he was doing it. So there was a drug on the horizon everybody was very excited about. Finally, there was going to be one for women. And yet they hit a roadblock with the FDA. They hit more of a roadblock in the public conversation, so they were going to put it on the shelf. So they were at the time in trials. They went out to those women who were in trials and were going to tell them, give us the medicine back. We're walking away. Irwin, being the pioneer that he is, decided to film those conversations with women. So what he was chasing me around with was videos of women when he delivered the news that this medication that had meaningfully helped them was about to be taken back away. And I watched them as they did their hands like this, as they cried and talked about what it would mean for their relationships. And that was my moment in which I decided to sell off my easy and profitable business and men and take on this challenge with the FDA. So I went out, I got the drug from this company that was gonna put it on the shelf, and we studied it in 11,000 women. 11,000 women. By context, the average new drug approval is 760 patients. We studied ours in 11,000. And we submitted it to the FDA, we met all of our endpoints, and they denied it. So what do you do when they deny it? Well, in our case, we take out some pink boxing gloves and we take them on. And the reason I did that was because of those women in the videos. I made a decision to dispute the FDA it's a path that's available, I like to call it the road less traveled. And why did I do it? I did it because I had 11,000 women worth of data that gave us the answer already. But that wasn't good enough, right? So I had to start thinking, what was it? In medicine, everything comes down to a decision on benefit and risk, right? It sounds so objective, doesn't it? That sounds so pristine and scientific. And yet, if you assign no value to the benefit of something, then any risk would be too great. And it was clear to me that that was what was going on here, that there was a lack of empathy for what these women were going through. And I'll tell you, I think benefit is in the eye of the beholder. In the hardest days, in those days of dispute, women wrote me every single day. I'll show you just the letter here on the left, a woman from Texas, who wrote to me and basically said, you know, I'm, I, my marriage is in trouble. In essence, she said, you know, I've lost all interest in sex. We have sex when my husband can't take it anymore, but I'm waiting every day for him to ask me for a divorce. And if you go to the bottom of her letter, what does she say? She says, thank you for telling me it's not my fault. Thank you for not telling me it's all in my head. And mostly, thank you for telling me that I'm not alone. I just listen to women. And when I listened to them, I thought, so too should our government should our clinicians, and we should look at it through that lens as we made that value judgment. So when I started asking some critical questions, all of a sudden, here we were, um, right here in Raleigh, uh, nobody knew who Sprout Pharmaceuticals were, Nightline shows up, and then people start going up the elevator and going, I know what you do on the 10th floor now. Um, so <laughs> when that happened, a public conversation started, and some of the leading women's health, women's rights advocates, got on a bus, they went to the FDA in DC, and they, had, they asked some critical questions. Women started to speak out too. Women opened the doors of their bedroom and shared really their most intimate story in order to make change for everybody. And so too did a pop culture conversation start. Reporters started calling. And it was interesting, I can think of one story in particular in which a reporter called me and she said, She'd read about one of the women who'd been in the clinical trials and said that she was a responder. Not all women respond to this drug, but she had been a responder, and she started meeting her husband at the door when he got home at night, and it had really made such a difference in their life. 
And so she reads the story, the reporter calls me, she goes, listen, Cindy, I'm 38 years old, I have a toddler, sometimes my husband wants to have sex, I wanna have a burrito. <laughs> Which I appreciated, I, li I liked her for that. Um, and she said, who are these women who wanna have sex all the time? She had rules. Her rules were her own rules for sex. And I said to her, I want you to consider that you're putting that on these women. Your normal is their normal. And yet for these women, it would be a luxury to say, honey, not tonight. They've completely lost their biological drive. So I thought, okay, she's kind of staying with me. And I said, let me, let me ask you this question. Do you have any girlfriends who are on antidepressants? I knew what her answer was gonna be. She said, yes. And I said, do you ever turn to them and say, hey, suck it up, life's hard? She said, no, absolutely not. I said, well, why don't you say it? And she said, well, I don't say it because we know that it's a medical condition. And she's telling me brain chemical imbalance. Uh, she's going down that. I said, exactly. That's exactly what it is for these women. It's a brain chemical imbalance. And yet you're saying to them, suck it up. And so she said, gosh, I kind of feel like an asshole. I said, great, will you write that in the story? And she said, <laughs> she said, not a chance, but I will link to all the brain scan studies. And so it started to change. And ultimately, empathy came into the picture. And we didn't make a value judgment on the benefit of treating it and whether or not they deserve for us to hand it over to make the choice for themselves on whether or not they wanted to deal with the risk to change things. So empathy, in my mind, um, is what ultimately changed the game. We got the drug approved. Uh, I turned around, sold the company in order for it to be globalized to women across the world and be broadly, affordably accessible to them. But it was quite a moment. Science actually won. The data had always been there. What hadn't been there, I think, was our appreciation, if you will, of what they were going through so that we would open our mind to the science. And that taught me that empathy really does inform data differently. And as we look forward to a future in which everything is going to ones and zeros, everything is code, everything is data, everything is machine learning, it's VR, it's AR, all of those things, I think the distinction of success, the distinction of leadership, will in fact be empathy. It will be more important than ever for us to look at spreadsheets and data through the lens of somebody else's eyes to walk a mile in their shoes. And I think if I look at that from a leadership position and look out into the world, it is why I believe that the world ultimately should be painted pink with female leadership because empathy is the DNA of a female rule breaker. Thank you.